Rain, the source of Earth's fresh water and essential to life. Since our earliest ancestors walked the land, rain has shaped humanity and played its part in the rise and fall of civilizations. There's a famous saying, we kalani ola kahonua, and in Hawaiian, and it means when the heavens cry, the land lives, and that's what rain is. And that's why it continues to play a pivotal role in the rituals of societies around the world. Rain refills our lakes and reservoirs, providing the water each of us needs every day. It feeds us by nourishing our soil, enabling our crops to grow and our livestock to flourish. But as rainfall patterns become more unpredictable, how will our relationship to rain be transformed in the years to come? And how do we make the most of this precious resource? The water that rain provides may well be our single most valuable commodity. After all, none of us could survive much more than three days without it. So as climate change disrupts rain around the world, how are communities adapting to the shortfall? And too much rain is a catastrophe just as deadly as too little. As the consequences of our changing climate become clearer, how we make the best use of rain is now one of the most pressing questions of our time. And if we fail to find the answers soon, the price we have to pay may just be too high. The west coast of Ireland gets plenty of rain each year. However, it's the continuous struggle with a lack of water that defines the lives of those living on Inishir in Galway Bay. It's a to alleviate the problems, 200,000 litres of water a day are shipped in during the driest summer months. The resourceful people of Inishir have their own methods of collecting water and use their supply wisely for projects like their community garden. 
die Inters kann schon erklären, nach dem Machen, das ist gezahlt, gedürrt und stechen, das ist gegangen. Wie du an, wenn du Kindchen, gerade ist gegangen, und so nach dem Machen, das ist gegangen. Aber es waren zu Kuppel aussagt, es ist gegangen. Nicht nur in der Kasse, Kasse in der Schicke, in der Warte, das ist eine Warte in Europa. Since the island relies on rainwater for its freshwater supply, this is collected in purpose-built tanks. Shota la kronal, shota kie dochen el seir tarish boshti, ko fejilen boshti wailo ishke wailo la kure kobel la shesar ko shkosahein el ish tarish trum. Chukure kichachtel, ach nochen el hesa chosing ivre no tarish ramchi boshti shve da hesa ko chishon. Ta'ashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashashash
Rising in the Rocky Mountains, the Colorado River is one of the principal rivers of the United States. Fed by snowmelt from the Rockies, it winds its way through seven states in the arid western plains and is a vital source of water for 40 million people. In 1922, water rights were divided between the states of the upper and lower river basin, paving the way for the construction of 15 dams. The most famous is the Hoover Dam. A modern colossus, shouldering the rock-ribbed walls of Black Canyon, stemming and controlling the floods, and bending the will of a hitherto ungovernable stream, the Colorado River, to perform the fruitful tasks of a civilization rapidly invading the limits of its last frontier. The dam created Lake Mead, a vast reservoir which by today provides water to 20 million people. But the supply to this and other reservoirs along the river is under threat. Climate change is causing the entire Colorado River Basin to warm. And ultimately, that, what that results in is a lower runoff efficiency. So when we're looking at the amount of runoff that we receive or the amount of precipitation compared to the amount of water getting in the reservoir, that relationship is changing. Starting in 2000, the Colorado River reservoirs were generally full. But the turn of the century marked a drying period for the Colorado River. So we've gone from reservoirs that were almost full to reservoirs that are in the 30 to 40 percent full range right now. We need to be prepared to use less. As Lake Mead supplies water to the whole of the Las Vegas Valley, water restrictions were put in place soon after the drought began. Okay. Go ahead and look at 9512. Grand Canal. Perry Kay has been a water waste investigator in the Las Vegas Valley for the past 18 years. Water waste investigator 7158. Time is now 7.07 a.m., 3rd of November. I have an irrigation system leak causing runoff. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. The types of water waste violations that are against the law are watering on the wrong day or a broken sprinkler or a malfunction, as we call them, where water is coming off the property. We have various ways of finding water waste. We patrol neighborhoods. Also, we have reports from the citizens that will report that there is a water waste violation going on. We'll investigate those as well. I have a day of the week violation, water group D on a Wednesday, winter schedule. Also have spray and flow, misaligned sprinklers causing runoff. A big component that really matters is that outdoor water use. And so when we look at having a watering schedule, we don't get rain. So our grass really is all surviving based upon potable water that comes out of Lake Mead. And uh, we joke that there's a special place in hell for people who water their lawn in winter uh, the same amount of days they water when it's 108 degrees out here in the summer. So our watering schedule adjusts. You can water six days a week in the summer three days a week in the spring and fall, and one day a week in the winter. We have less than 50% compliance despite having that mandatory watering schedule. And we found that, you know, it's important to have a carrot and a stick. And that's sort of um, the stick side of our approach is having water waste investigators. To help save water, a turf removal program has been in place since 2000. Residents are paid for substituting their grass with desert-friendly planting. But this once voluntary option is about to change. We worked with our legislature this last year to mandate the removal of what we call non-functional turf. So turf that is only serving an aesthetic purpose in our community has to be removed by 2026 and can no longer be irrigated with Colorado River water. Uh, we have been really aggressive in trying to stay ahead of 
our water use trends um, and really keep them in check and make sure we're using water as responsibly as we can. Whilst vast swathes of green are still permitted, like golf courses, parks and playing fields, the phasing out of non-functional grass is a significant step in water conservation. But one company offers a purely cosmetic solution to those who still love their lawns. Lawn paint is a product that you apply to a lawn as if you're dyeing the lawn just like you'd be dyeing hair. And when lawn turns brown, paint it and it stays green until the grass grows out. Uh, it's a little bit kooky. It's a product that's been known commercially. It's been used in Disneyland and theme parks and golf courses for decades. So it's not a new thing. It's just not something that consumers have been aware of. It always does settle the color after a few minutes, so it'll be a little brighter at first. We always have to be looking out for wind because if this gets on you, it's going to stay there. I have many pairs of shoes that I used to really enjoy wearing that are now spotted green. After this is fully dry, you can roll around on the grass just like anything else. It will not harm the groundwater. It does not harm the grass at all. It's completely safe, non-toxic. This is simply colorant. It doesn't make the grass grow. It doesn't kill weeds. It just makes everything green. Our business heats up in different parts of the country at different times of year based on the normal seasons. Parts of California are very dry in the summer, so we'll sell it there when it's dry there. Um, places like Florida can have uh, dry spells in the winter, depending upon where we're talking about. Um, there's also the case that when you have an event, a wedding business, or a home that's being staged for sale, anything that's brown or patchy is going to look terrible, and real estate agents across the country understand that they have to make that home look saleable, so grass paint, lawn paint is one of the ways that they do that. With an average of 190 wet days each year, painting their lawns is something the inhabitants of the west of Scotland are never likely to have to do. So one of the challenges for local architects, like Martin Bailey, is to create buildings that can withstand Scotland's soggy climate. It's an upbuild of a chiac in your house, and it's money hooked all as many different elements in a nishke, the mesk. in nearby Helensborough stands the Hill House, a magnificent building designed by the world-famous Scottish architect, Charles Rennie Mackintosh. But flaws in the design means the building is prone to damp, so the National Trust covered it in a chainmail mesh to protect it from the rain and allow the house to dry out. An admirer of Mackintosh's work, Martin's come to analyse the damage rain has wreaked on the building. Here is the show, ground in the Rudnick High. Here, I think it's in the Rudnick High, Mackintosh, you can feel it in the end of the night, the Rudnick, 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 the R
is it came out urna sa gewone genau mit hier in der render römisch schachet das hat ich jetzt ähm gar pist in tai und dann da weg gema mot noch äh norschen war es mönch genau gegen gaxen genov äh ein klachtig portland cement rit weg zu ur ich guess nach rot du lache tüchchen genau I guess the delicate as a realm ha um Portland cement gama gama tie nach I guess like air back in Ischke a stark and in Tokloch a halleke tie nach as it did so much in high a glee gushke and brain and balochen I guess reun you has to like a grotte gus ha a khwach a tuchem as a khida to this day um and card of a chimiclet ah gama did if kitchen the written sound is about macintosh a fierce me and vision day a kirst cast famous in style at the reality it gets in about fierce me and a hagama and if i can do i guess could you mock in in an hour but you and is a leg she kissed gama gama tiny i guess did it how much can you figure down hast Finding answers to challenging questions is at the heart of the World Resources Institute's mission as they advise governments and multinationals on the most efficient use of our natural resources. At their Beijing office, Tiani Luo and his team know that one industry more than any other is responsible for the world's dwindling freshwater reserves. Agriculture is by far the biggest water user on the planet, accounting for about 95% of the total amount of water that human consume every year. About 70% of the groundwater withdrawn globally is used for agriculture, and many of the most rapidly depleting groundwater sources or aquifers are beneath some of the world's largest irrigated lands. To put it simply, an aquifer is where groundwater is stored. When water is needed in places where there isn't any surface water or there isn't enough surface water, we dig into the earth and we get water from the groundwater aquifers. But aquifers are like bank accounts. If you take out more than you put in, sooner or later, it'll be depleted. India is by far the largest groundwater user in the world. And our data shows that the average groundwater level under India's northern plains has been declining by over 8 centimeters every year for the past 20 years or so. The official data from the Indian government shows that for the entire country, over 17% of its groundwater blocks are already overexploited. Rajasthan, in the northwest of India, is the most water-deficient state in the country. The semi-arid landscape is pockmarked by boreholes and wells dug by generations of farmers desperate to access the precious groundwater reserves. Water levels here are critically low, as wells grow ever deeper and many rivers have run dry. But since 1984, thanks to the efforts of Rajendra Singh, also known as the Waterman of India, many communities have now managed to regenerate their once arid landscape by reviving the ancient water harvesting method of the Johad, or percolation pond, that stores rainwater and recharges groundwater levels. Today, Singh is revisiting a recently constructed Johad to see the impact it has had on the community and the surrounding land. Singh's work is recognized worldwide. In 2015, he was awarded the Stockholm Water Prize for his efforts in improving water security for the people of India. As well as regenerating the landscape, 
Joe hats also seem to have a direct impact upon the local climate. Talab nad anikar chagdam banaye to mitti ka kataav roka mitti mein moisture badha to mitti mein jab moisture badha to us mitti mein hariyali aane lagi wo jo hariyali thi usne hamari dharti ka jo nangi thi viram thi जो एक तरह से रन सेडो रीजन बन गई थी वो हरियाली आने लगी और हरियाली आने से उस हरियाली ने ट्रांस एवोपरेशन शुरू किया उसके कारण माइक्रो क्लाउड फॉर्मेशन होने लगे और उन माइक्रो क्लाउड्स ने जो हमारे मैक्रो क्लाउड आते थे अरेबियन सी से और बे ऑफ बंगाल से उनको अपनी तरफ अट्रैक्ट करना शुरू किया तो जिस जो हमारी रन सेडो रीजन थी अब वो पूरे का पूरा रनफेड एरिया हो गया अब वहाँ बहुत अच्छी खेती होती है आ, हमने पिछले 38 सालों में ग्यारह हजार बांध जोहड़ बनाए और इनके कारण 17 लाख लोगों को रोजगार मिला 1200 गांव जो उजड़ गए थे बेपानी हो गए थे वो लोग अपने आप वापस आके पानी आते के साथ and Singh believes that these kinds of results can only be achieved on a local level. Samudayik vikendri jal prabandhan karne ki zarurat hai. Bharat mein 15,000 se bhi zada chhoti chhoti nadiya hai. Un nadiyo mein gaon ke log apni nadiyo ko, apne odo ko, apne nalo ko punar jivit ka karne ka kaam karne lage, yehi mera vision hai. On this isolated island off the west coast of Ireland, monks sought solitude from the 6th century onwards. They also had to learn to make efficient use of their limited water supply. They came here because they believed that such an extreme location would give them a closer relationship with God. And like a desert, the island has a shortage of fresh water. Lane Tubber er on Elian, Ni Lane Tubber fear Ishke, Ni Lane Awen, Neil fear Ishke er an Elian, Acha Hitten an Us on Spare. So, you know, Damech Trimacht Schachten Awen. Being in such an exposed location, the monks would have had to contend with harsh weather conditions and plenty of rain. So they devised an ingenious method of harvesting the rainwater. When it rained, the water would have come down and filled the well. So what we're looking at here is these upright orth orthostats, as we call them, and they've utilised the natural rock at the bot at the back, uh, the sloping rock, and then you have this flagstone flagged bottom to it, like we have out here, mm -hmm. and really kind of using the the natural geology to manage the water collection. Mm -hmm. So they worked with nature to ensure that they could survive out here. So they, they were in tune with nature. The way they um, utilised the sloping rock and then the channels that they put into it along the fault lines of the rock itself showed quite a sophisticated understanding of the geology. The cisterns here are, are really, I suppose, unique into themselves though. Uh, they, they really set out to, to make sure that they had a source of fresh water when they needed it. You would have had a vibrant community here that would have had, um, you know, the need to use quite a bit of water. During that period, there was a deterioration in the climate, so it became a lot more storms, it became colder, uh, so living conditions here may well have become just untenable and they had to move back to the mainland.
Between Scotland's mainland mountain masses and the island of Skye lies the Applecross Peninsula, one of Britain's remotest settlements. In the past, Applecross could only be reached by boat and until recent decades, only by a treacherous high pass. To survive, this small community has had to use its resources creatively, including making the most of its abundant rain. The electricity created by the dam is sold to the national grid, enabling the community to take positive action in safeguarding its own future. I guess a schema hokutrmach or er mohul of a shaw. Mar farsi in the schema as na buanach and the higas ha company na koirshnach er an tachig shaw hianach agus hashin an dúg be taihin at all stiach taihinik prish recenta vias na chutchig a dhéanú aca agus sonja halig in the skira agus a chumal skira mhaidir san furach an la nuinne so shenu sa cutmach agus ha jalin na ha chin mar farsi in the schema hydro bishin at all stiach in the taihin ik a chán hau. So I should fake in Manaha, Carker, Lewis, and Jalen, the Dolls Jack, and the Tyhan, I guess, Dania Hummel, I guess, could be attached to Jean Biori. In Kenya, a different form of regeneration is taking place using a simple yet groundbreaking rain harvesting method. Lanoi Metakini works for the Maasai Wilderness Conservation Trust, who have teamed up with the Just Dig It charity to make the most of the rainfall in the area. Working with local people across Kenya and Tanzania, Just Dig It have regreened over 60,000 hectares of land and have brought over six million trees back to life. Their aim is to expand these projects across Africa. When I was growing up, there were a lot of uh, trees and vegetation cover as compared to now. I also get stories from my parents and my grandparents on how the rainfall was there before. There were a lot of rains as compared to now and there were flowing rivers in Kuku which have now all dried up. The landscape has changed due to various factors, such as overgrazing and increase of population and human activities, such as conversion of wetlands to farmlands. Uh, the level of rainfall has dropped. For example, last year we had 400 mils 
of rainfall. There were no uh, long droughts as we're experiencing today, which is leading to the livestock moving to other communities in search of pasture. As a result, we are getting conflicts with the other communities because of uh, the few resources. As a community, we noticed uh, these negative effects and uh, we decided to have the band project as an initiative to help harvesting water so that we can have a sustainable vegetation even during the dry seasons. Bands are semicircular holes 2.5 meters long and 5 meters wide. They are dug by hand in areas that have a slight incline to prevent water runoff. Persistent droughts have caused the top layer of soil to harden, preventing rain from seeping into the ground. Digging the buns loosens the soil and begins the process of regeneration. Part of Lanoi's work involves travelling to Maasai communities in the Kuku Group Ranch to demonstrate how to dig and seed the buns. After the intervention, there was a big difference. New indigenous trees coming back and new bushes. By bringing back uh, the vegetation, we are able to cool down the place. And also by having more vegetation, the carbon is... Uh, absorbed and as a result we get more rainfall. Africa and the rest of the world can learn what we are doing here because if we managed to do it here they can also do it as it is important not only to their livelihoods but also to the ecosystem. Rain harvesting is very important as uh, it will enable us to be sustainable even during the dry seasons. Just Dig It's projects have allowed thousands of people to remain in their homes instead of being displaced by droughts. Droughts which are partly linked to changes thousands of miles away in some of the most awe-inspiring ecosystems on our planet. Rainforests. Often described as the lungs of the world, these vast swathes of forest convert carbon dioxide into the oxygen we all breathe. But they also play a key role in the water cycle and are a vital tool in regulating the global climate. Tropical rainforests have so many interesting features, but one of the most surprising to many people is that they actually generate their own rainfall. Rainforests are a critical part of the water cycle because they're able to draw water from deep in the soil. There are places in the Amazon where roots from trees go down more than 40 feet, and they draw water that's been stored from rainy seasons years past. That water flows from those deep roots up through the leaves and into the atmosphere, where it starts the cycle of convective storms, thunderstorms, and other rainfall patterns. That biotic pump is such a critical part of our understanding of the tropics and its role in the rainy season, as well as its impacts then on the rest of the globe. But this fragile cycle is under threat, as 10 million hectares of primary forest is cut down every year. Tropical rainforests are part of their own self-sustaining rainfall cycle. If 50% of the rain that falls on the Amazon region has been passed through at least one tree, then removing trees risks interrupting that biotic pump, reducing the amount of rainfall, and changing where those areas of rainfall, the winners and losers of rainfall, not just in the tropical rainforest regions, but across the globe. Whilst deforestation in itself has a significant and direct impact upon rain formation, the way in which the forest is cleared is also having catastrophic consequences. Fires are a critical part of the deforestation process. So we look across the tropics, looking down from space with our satellites, we see fires springing up every year across the agricultural frontiers, pushing further into tropical rainforest regions. Those fires send smoke high into the atmosphere, 
And it turns out that that smoke actually prevents clouds from forming. So one of the most sinister feedbacks is that those fires prevent rain from forming. So fires during the dry season across the Amazon frontier actually delay the onset of the rainy season. We've seen that the rainforest dry season has gotten longer, putting rainforest regions even beyond the deforestation frontier at risk of drought and dieback associated with that reduction in rainfall. The Honghe Hani rice terraces in China receive a massive 1,400 millimeters of rain every year. But this area is also prone to dry periods. For a thousand years, the Hani people have harnessed their rainwater by creating and managing an intricate network of interconnected terraces fed by ditches. But delayed rainy seasons are causing many of the ditches to dry up. The process of regenerating the terrace begins with clearing and seeding. Once that is done, attention can be turned to diverting the water into it. As ditch leader, Yang Cheng Zhang is responsible for the maintenance of the ditches in his village. His daily work involves inspecting the water flow of the ditches and fixing them where necessary. Today, he and the other villagers are replacing some of the wood used to control the flow of the water to the ditches. Regular upkeep by all the communities who live here means that a constant flow of water allows the terraces to flourish, maintaining a thousand-year-old tradition. The narrative surrounding climate change tends to focus on the lack of rain. But extreme flooding due to excessive rainfall is a problem that many communities around the world are having to face more and more often. According to the World Bank, 1.47 billion people globally are directly exposed to the risk of extreme flooding, and over a third of them are poor. Mitigating this threat is one of the major challenges facing governments around the world. To deal with the problem of floods in the rapidly expanding cities of China, Professor Yu Konyang has come up with the idea of creating green spaces that can absorb all the excess water. 
，给水以空间，因为水它必须要有空间，所以这就是海绵城市的理念，这是我一直在倡导的。工业文明留下来的灰色的基础设施，成绿色的生态的基础设施。啊，一个小一个小村庄，两边啊溪流，啊两条溪流，就从小就跟在河里游泳。啊、呃，在河里抓鱼，是吧？小时候这个洪水来了，啊，鱼就上来了，所以对洪水，啊，有一种非常啊，有期盼的这种心情，知道怎么样管理水，知道水怎么样能能够灌溉庄稼，啊，所以这就是从小，从小就学会了跟自然的这种和谐的关系。And Professor Yu's love of nature played a key role in his radical solution to the problems caused by the rapid expansion of the Chinese urban landscape during the 1980s and 90s. 啊，所以我最早提出了这个关于海绵的概念，把自然的城市中的湿地、城市中的河流、城市中的湖泊、城市中的低洼地，都要变成海绵，变成平时就是公园绿地。下雨的时候，这些地方都可以容纳水，啊，历史上就是这样。中国古代黄河流域的城市都是啊这样的。Simple ideas informed Professor Yu's planning. Since water fills the lowest ground first, that is where the green spaces need to go. This means building the parks next to the rivers, and building important infrastructure on higher ground. That is easy enough to do in new cityscapes, but what can you do with areas which have already been built upon? Beijing's Yongxing River is all water, steel, wood, and wood extracted, right? A river stream. So we used the concept of the urban cities, cut out the water stream, cut out the wood stream, and it became a natural river, a green river. It is to let the rain from the sky come down. The sponge city concept allows the city to absorb flood water, to store it in ponds and tanks for future use in case of drought, and to create green spaces where people can relax and enjoy urban life in a beautiful setting. China has trialed the idea in 30 cities, but Professor Yu's vision is even broader. 与其花几百亿、上千亿做防洪堤，我不如让这些田给淹掉，淹掉了才能保住城市，淹掉了才能保住农村。但庄稼地是可以淹掉，因为淹完以后，它小用不生不用化肥，可以不使用化肥，小用化肥。从海绵城市到海绵田园，再到海绵国土，就是让国土来吸收、净化雨水，补充地下水，然后滋润这个整个土地，是吧？万物得以啊昌盛。Rain has a huge impact on our lives. The fact that we need it to survive means it has always shaped our traditions and customs. But as the climate changes, so will where and when rain falls. Communities will need to adapt when extremes become more commonplace. Some of the solutions will be global, some will be local. But all of us will have to learn when to conserve and when to control rain. So the more we know about rain, the better we can respond to the challenges ahead. <laughs>